Hi friends, uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the Nurse Channel. Uh, hope you all are doing fine. So uh, I think you all have gone through the videos what we have uploaded before, like the series we are, what we have already started for the preparation of ACT exam and the upcoming JIPMER exam. So uh, today also we have come up with another 16 questions uh, uh, from different uh, uh, aspects of our nursing topics and uh, these questions also will be uh, very very helpful for you for the upcoming exams not only for the JIPMER and um, uh, ACT exam but it will be very very helpful for your upcoming uh, NORSET and uh, the ESIC exams which are about to announce. So once again welcome welcoming all you back to our channel and uh, well, our series is continuing that is uh, ACT and the JIPMER series and uh, here comes the 16 questions another 16 very very important and tricky questions for you uh, and uh, prepare very well and uh, listen carefully and uh, watch till the end okay. So before starting and before moving to our questions once again I request everyone uh, who are not yet subscribed to our channel kindly subscribe and support us and kindly share to you with your nursing friends okay. So straight away we will move on to the uh, today's uh, uh, first question. So here comes your first question in our series. So we will start our uh, questions. So uh, this time we have 16 questions in the ACT uh, IMST series. So uh, here comes the first question for you. So the first question is from the oncology. So the question is most cervical cancers arise from the question is the most cervical cancers arise from so the question is regarding the position the where the cervical cancers are arising from okay many of the most of the cervical cancers are arising from where so the options for you are the first option is from the endo cervix the second option is from the ecto cervix the third option is from the os of the cervix and the final option number d at the junction of ecto and endo cervix so where the cervical cancers can be seen most okay so what is the answer so the answer is option number d at the junction of ecto and endo cervix okay it's at the junction of ecto and endo cervix so we will some uh, information about the cervical cancers and the type of cervical cancer etc very briefly so we know that most of the cervical cancers that is up to 9 out of 10 cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinomas okay so many of the cervical cancer cells are uh, cancer uh, cancers are squamous cell carcinomas and most of them begin in the transformation zone so where is the transformation zone transformation zone means where the exocervix joins the endocervix so it is at the junction of the exocervix and the endocervix okay so many of the most of the uh, uh, cervical cancers are uh, of squamous cell carcinoma type that means 9 out of the 10 carcinomas and it begins in the transformation zone where the exocervix joins the endocervix okay so that's all about the first question i think it is clear for you now we will move on to our second question in this series that second question is yeah this is from the endocrine system so the question is the hormone adh works in which area of kidney okay so the hormone adh works in which area of kidney so the question is very clear so we will move on to the options the options are option number a distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts option number b proximal convoluted tubule and loop of henle option number three loop of henle and collecting ducts and the final option proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule so where adh works in the kidney that's the question for you whether it is in the, it is in the dct and the collecting tube ducts prox pct or the loop of henley loop of henley and the collecting ducts or pct and the dct so what is the answer so the answer is option number a distal convoluted tubule or the dct and collecting ducts okay so that is the answer for the question so we will we will see uh, we know that the antidiuretic hormone or the ADH binds to the receptors on the cells in the collecting ducts of the kidney, mainly in the collecting duct of the kidney and promotes the reabsorption of water back into the circulation. Okay, so option number one, one what we have discussed here that is distal convoluted tubule and the collecting tube ducts are the places where the antidiuretic hormones binds. Okay, uh, and thereby the reabsorption of water back into the circulation happens okay so we will uh, move on to the third question in our series the question is from the uh, obstetrics and gynecology the question is 
post ovulation is also known as the question is very simple post ovulation is also known as so uh, just uh, think about the phases of menstruation in your mind and answer this question the post ovulation is also known as and the options for you are option number a the luteal phase the option number b the lunar phase option number c the follicular phase and the final option option number d the zonal phase so the post ovulation phase is also known as so just think about the phases of menstruation and you can find the answer of this question very easily so what is the answer so definitely the answer is option number a that is a luteal phase okay so now we will see the phases of menstruation in brief okay in brief i will explain so we know that the menstrual phase that means the bleeding phase or the menses or the menstruation is happening during the day one to five approximately it can vary in some individuals so the uh, it can be uh, range from day one to five and we have two phases and the first phase is the follicular phase and in the follicular phase is from the day 1 to day 13 okay so the day 1 of the menstrual cycle to the do, to the day 13 is the follicular phase and you know that then comes the ovulation the ovulation will happen and that is known as the ovulation phase and it will be approximately around the day 14 of the menstrual cycle and the last phase that is the post ovulation is the luteal phase that is from day 15 to 28 okay so uh, in total we can divide the days accordingly so the menstrual phase means that the bleeding phase will be from day one to day five and it can vary according to the individuals and the follicular phase it is from the day one to the day 13 and the ovulation phase is day 14 and the luteal phase is from day 15 to day 28 okay and i'll give you uh, a um, an important message like in each phase we have uh, several hormones hormonal influence also should be studied very well okay so that i am not going in depth into the topic so whenever you are getting time you just go through that also okay the uh, hormonal influences in these phases okay that also is very very important in exam point of view and in the next sessions we will try to add questions from that also okay so now we will more i think that question is uh, clear for you that is the luteal phase is the post ovulation phase okay so next we will move on to the next question that is question number four and the question is the role of a lacuna in a bone is okay it's regarding the orthopedics the role of a lacuna in a bone is so what is the role of lacuna so just think about the anatomy of the bone and you can answer this question very easily so the options for you are option number a to house an osteocyte option number b to destroy osteocytes option number c to house blood cells and option number d to destroy blood cells so just think about osteocytes which just to think about the bone marrow blood vessels blood cells everything and you can answer this question very easily so the, what is the role of lacuna in a bone so what is the answer so the answer is option number a that is to house an osteocyte so you know that you know that what is an osteocyte so that also you have to go through what is an osteocyte osteoclast uh, those bone cells okay so now we will see uh, uh, the explanation for this question you know that the bone cells otherwise known as the osteocytes are uh, located in the spaces called lacuna okay so this lacuna occupies the bone cells called osteocytes okay and from there we will get small channels called canaliculae that radiate from the lacuna to the osteonic canal or the harvation canal okay so the small channels will be there which is named as the canaliculae that radiate from the lacuna to the harvation canal so i will explain what is harvation canal also because it, this is also very very important so harvation canal otherwise sometimes called as the canals of the havers are a series of micro microscopic tubes in the outermost region of the bone which is called the cortical bone okay so this harvation canals are a series of microscopic tubes which can be seen in the outer region of the bone which is known as the cortical bone so what is the function of this harvation canal they allow the blood vessels and the nerves to travel through them to supply the osteocytes okay so it will be supplying the osteocytes bone cells and the bone cells will function accordingly so the blood vessels nerves everything will be traveled through this harvation canal which is a series of microscopic tubes which can be seen in the outermost region of the bone which is known as a cortical bone okay so from this question we have learned about what is a lacuna and what is canaliculae and what is osteocyte and uh, what is a harvation canal okay so nearly so four to five important points we have got from this uh a question okay so uh, i think this question is clear for you now now we will move on to the next question in our series that is the fifth question and the question is 
which muscle is the strongest flexor of the elbow okay so the question you should be very careful which muscle is the strongest flexor of the elbow so the key points in this question are the first one is the strongest muscle strongest flexor okay and elbow so which is that muscle so here the options for you are option number a biceps option number b trapezius option number c deltoid and the final option number d brachialis so among these which is the strongest flexor of the elbow so what is the answer so here comes the answer the answer is option number d brachialis okay so now we will see uh, the brachialis muscle is the primary flexor of the elbow and two muscles the triceps brachii and the anconius act as the uh, extensors of the forearm okay so uh, the primary flexor of the elbow is the brachialis muscle and the triceps brachii and the anconius which is acts, acting as the extensors of the forearm okay so i think this question also is very clear for you now now we will move on to the next question in our series there is a sixth question and the question is from the oncology the question is which of the following is the greatest risk factor for pancreatic cancer so the question key points are greatest risk factor pancreatic cancer so what is the greatest risk factor for pancreatic cancer that is a question for you and the options are the first option is family history the second option is smoking the third option is alcohol consumption and the final option is obesity okay so all these are the risk factors for the development of pancreatic cancer and among this which is the greatest risk factor that is a question for you okay so what is the answer pancreatic cancer so the answer is option number a family history okay family history is the greatest risk factor for the development of pancreatic cancer so we know that the individuals with a family history of pancreatic cancer are at an increased lifetime risk for the development of pancreatic cancer okay so this what is happening is the inherited gene changes that is the mutations can be passed from generations to generation that is from parent to child okay so that's why uh, the family history is the greatest risk factor for the development of pancreatic cancer okay i think it is clear for you now now we will move on to our seventh question in this series so it's a, a simple question and it is from the nail anatomy and the question is the white area of the nail is called dash the white area of the nail is called dash question is very simple white area of the nail so the options are cochlea option number b dermis option number c cutaneous layer and the final option lunula so what is the answer the whitish area of the nail is called dash whitish area cochlea dermis cutaneous layer lunula so what is the answer so you know the answer answer is option number d that is a lunula so we will see uh, the parts of the nail in brief okay in brief i will give you an explanation regarding the part of the nail the first one is the nail plate what we can see in our the visible part of the nail that is the uh, nail plate then comes the nail bed what is the nail bed the skin beneath the nail is called nail plate is known as the nail bed otherwise known, we can uh, name this as uh, nicheum so we have hyponicheum hyponicheum paranicheum like that okay so the nail bed otherwise known as the nicheum is the skin beneath the nail plate okay so i'll show you a diagram also so in the cuticle what is a cuticle so one of the option was cuticle what is a cuticle T cuticle is the tissue that overlaps the plate and rims the base of the nail okay so so the cuticle is the base of the nail so not lunula cuticle is the base of the nail and next comes the nail fold what is a nail fold we have nail folds that supports the uh, the skin folds that frame and support the nail on three sides that is a nail fold so next comes the lunula what was the question we have asked that is the whitish half moon at the base of the nail okay so don't be confused with the cuticle and the lunula the cuticle is the tissue that overlaps the nail plate and rims the base of the nail but the whitish half moon like structure what we can see in our base of the nail is the lunula and the uh, and next one was the matrix so what is the matrix of the nail the hidden part of the nail unit under the cuticle okay so under the cuticle there will be a hidden part 
and that is known as a matrix okay so in short we can see the diagram here in this diagram we can explain so this is a hyponychium and a, a peri a perionychium and a hyponychium that is uh, what we have uh, told here like the nail bed that is the nail bed this nichium okay and uh, next is the free edge that we are uh, we used to cut and remove so this is the nail plate which is the visible part of the nail and these are the nail folds that supports the nail in place that we have a three nail folds here one here one here and one this side and uh, uh, we have lunula what was the question we have asked that is the moon shaped uh, at the base of the mm, nail and we have the cuticle that is a uh, at the base of the nail some tissues we can see that is a cuticle and under the cuticle there are mm, uh, under the cuticle we can see the matrix okay and this is the nail bed these are the nail grooves okay so i think uh, the nail anatomy is clear for you now with a simple single question you are getting an information regarding so many um, uh, answers for so many questions regarding the nail anatomy okay i think it is clear for you now now we will move on to our next question in this series the next question is the eighth question and the question is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system are part of the dash okay so the question is uh, uh, regarding the anatomy uh, regarding the basics of the central nervous system so uh, this is a very very simple question and it is confusing also so answer very carefully the question is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system are part of so the options are the first one is ans the second option is pns the third option is sns and the final option is cns so what is the answer ans stands for autonomic nervous system p stands for peripheral nervous system then uh, sympathetic nervous system and uh, central nervous system so uh, what is the answer the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system are part of easily you can omit one option that is option number c you can omit very easily so definitely you know the answer that is the option is option number a that is autonomic nervous system so we will see the classification uh, how it is divided the autonomic nervous system is a component of the peripheral nervous system okay and that regulates the involuntary physiological processes which includes increasing the heart rate or maintaining the heart rate blood pressure respiration digestion and sexual arousal okay so uh, in that we can this autonomic nervous system can be divided into three anatomical distinct divisions which include the sympathetic uh, nervous system the parasympathetic nervous system and the enteric uh, system okay so autonomic nervous system is the component of the peripheral nervous system and uh, this autonomic nervous system can be divided into sympathetic parasympathetic and enteric okay and uh, the function of the autonomic nervous system you know that is uh, all the physiological processes uh, it will includes all the involuntary physiological process like heart rate blood pressure respiration digestion sexual arousal etc okay so uh, i think that question also is very clear for you that was from the central nervous system so we will move on to our next question that is from the cardiovascular system and the question is very 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 simple but confusing and the question is the card cardiac cycle has how many phases okay it's a very direct question the question is very simple the cardiac cycle has how many phases so you have the options here uh, the option number a now uh, two option number b four option number c three and option number d one so cardiac cycle have how many phases that is a question for you what is the answer how many phases are there for the cardiac cycle so obviously the answer is option number a that is two we know that cardiac phases is essentially split into two phases only two phases that is a systole that means the contraction phase and the diastole that is a relaxation phase okay so that is very 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 simple question so the cardiac cycle is divided into only two phases that is the systole that is you know that that is a contraction and the diastole that is a relaxation phase okay so very simple question but confusing okay so now uh we will move on to the 10th question in our series so the question is uh yeah this is also a very uh, tricky question and the question is dash are small slender hair like structures present on the surface of the mammalian cell okay so the question is simple but uh, after seeing the options you will be confused okay so dash are small slender hair like structures present on the surface of the mammalian cell okay so the options for you are the first option is villi the second option is cilia the third option is diverticuli and the final option is varices okay so what is the answer so which are the small slender hair like structures present on the surface of the mammalian cells so what is the answer options are slightly confusing so we will explain about these options very uh, very thoroughly so 
we will see the answer first you know that the answer is cilia so cilia are the small slender hair like structures present on the surface of the mammalian cells then what about this villi diverticulae varices etc what is the difference between um, uh, these uh, options that we will see now so you know that the villi villi or the villus plural is the villi and it in anatomy any of the small slender vascular projections that increase the surface area of a membrane okay so these are small slender vascular projections that can increase the surface area of a membrane okay so this uh, what is the function of the villi villi can increase the surface area of the membrane okay then what is a diverticula diverticula is a condition so this is a disease condition in which the small bulging pouches develop in the digestive tract okay uh, diverticula it is information of these pouches the what uh, you know all uh, regarding that okay so diverticulum means it's a condition in which small bulging pouches can be seen which can be developed in the digestive tract and the final option was the varices so you have heard about the esophageal varices and all so varices are veins that are enlarged or swollen okay and you know that uh, in uh, cirrhosis and all there will be rupture of the esophageal varices can happen and that can result in upper GA bleeding okay so uh, so this is the difference so cilia already we have explained in the question that is these are the small slender hair like structures that is present on the surface of the mammalian cells it, is, it will, can be seen in the surface of the mammalian cell but villi are the uh, small slender vascular projections which can be which will be increasing the surface area of a membrane and diverticular is a condition in which the pouching will happen in the digestive tract and finally varices are the veins that are enlarged or swollen okay so i think uh, this was a very little tricky question but you are getting uh, so many information from uh, a single question so uh, now we will move on to the 11th question in our series so here comes the 11th question and it is from oncology again and the question is gold bladder cancer occurs most commonly at so the question is regarding the position where you can expect the gallbladder cancer most okay so the gallbladder cancer occurs most commonly at so just think about the parts of the gallbladder and answer the question so you know that uh, the options are the option number a fundus option number b body option number c neck and option number c cardia so in this if you know the anatomy of the gallbladder you can omit one option easily very easily that is uh, i am not telling okay you f just tell me the answer first so gallbladder cancer occurs most commonly at what is the answer so the answer is fundus okay so we know that only we have only three parts for the gallbladder that is fundus body and the neck cardia is belongs to some other anatomy structure that like stomach okay so now we will see why uh, in fundus it is more and uh, what those cancers are called okay so uh, we know that uh, the most gallbladder cancers begin in the glandular cells that line the inner surface of the gallbladder okay the most gallbladder cancer it begins in the glandular cells okay inside the cells that is a grand in the glandular cells we can expect the gallbladder cells to begin and that gallbladder these glandular cells are lining the inner surface of the gallbladder and the gallbladder cancer that begins in this type of cell is called adenocarcinomas okay so most of the cancers that can be seen inside the glands or inside these glandular cells are named as the adenocarcinoma okay so we can expect the uh, uh, in the fundus fundus is the answer for the question okay so uh, so you i think you are get you got an idea about the adenocarcinoma also from this question okay i think it is clear for you now now we will move on to the next question that is the 12th question in our series the question is which bone contains the foramen magnum okay so the skull anatomy think about the skull anatomy and answer the question so foramen magnum where is foramen magnum just think about that and answer the question which bone contains the foramen magnum so the options are um, the occipital lobe sorry the occipital bone the second option is the ethmoid the third option the sphenoid and the final option the vertebrae so which bone contains the foramen magnum simple easy question so you know the answer that is option number a that is occipital okay occipital bone contains the foramen magnum so we will see what is the foramen magnum and what is its function you know that the foramen magnum is a large oval shaped opening in the occipital bone of the skull so what is the shape of foramen magnum it is the shape is oval shaped and it is in the occipital bone okay so uh, 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 opening means something should pass through it okay so the spinal cord that is the extension of the medulla oblongata passes through the foramen magnum as it exits the cranial cavity okay and it transmits the vertebral arteries the anterior and the posterior spinal arteries the 
uh, uh, membranes and alar ligaments okay it also transmits the accessory nerves into the skull okay so uh, so what is the function of the uh, foramen magnum the foramen magnum it passes the spinal cord that is the extension of the middle lobe lungata and along with that it transmits the uh, vertebral arteries the anterior and the posterior spinal arteries the tectorial membrane and the alar ligaments okay so uh, arteries uh, veins then um, Mm, sorry, uh, major uh, uh, spinal cord arteries that is the vertebral arteries, anterior and posterior spinal arteries, and alar ligaments and the tectorial membranes. All these are things are uh, passing through this foramen uh, magnum from the skull. Okay, so that is was a very simple, easy question for you. Now we will move on to the 13th question in our series, and the question is the limbic system is situated in. So, where is the limbic system situated? Question is the limbic system is situated in. So anatomy of brain, think in mind and answer the question. Question option number A, in the motor cortex. Option number B, on both sides of the thalamus. And option number C, in the hypothalamus. And option number D, in the brainstem. So where is the limbic system situated? So think about the brain anatomy. Think about the function of the limbic system. So those things will be explained in the explanation. So first uh, answer is, give me the answer. Answer is option number so the answer is on option number b that is on both sides of the thalamus okay so the limbic system is situated in on both sides of the thalamus so uh, what is this limbic system so what is the other name for the limbic system so the limbic system is also known as the paleomammalian cortex okay so this is also known as the paleomammalian cortex and is a set of brain structures located on both sides of the thalamus immediately beneath the medial temporal lobe of the cerebrum primarily in the for brain okay so limbic system you know that it is also known as the paleomammalian cortex and these are the structures which are located on both sides of the thalamus that is a uh, answer for our question and it is immediately beneath the medial temporal lobe of the cerebrum primarily in the forebrain and what is the function um, of the limbic system it supports a variety of functions including emotions behavior long-term memory and olfaction okay so that is a function of the limbic system so the answer for our question is on both sides of the thalamus okay now we will move on to the 14th question that is i think the second last question in our series and the question uh, is the, from the gi system the eustachian tube okay not from the gi system that is from the uh mouth anatomy okay the eustachian tube links dash to dash so the question is very simple the eustachian tube links dash to dash so the options are the first option is the pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear the first option is pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear the second option is the larynx to the cavity of the middle ear the third option is the pharynx to the cavity of the inner ear and the final option is the pharynx to the cavity of the outer ear. So, uh, the eustachian tube will uh, link dash to dash. Pharynx to middle ear, larynx to middle ear, pharynx to inner ear, pharynx to outer ear. So, what is the answer for this question? Simple question. The answer is uh, pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear. Okay, pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear. So, what is the function of the eustachian tube? So that also we'll discuss now. Uh, it, you, you know that the uh, the eustachian tube is a narrow passage leading from the pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear, permitting the equalization of pressure on each side of the eardrum. Okay. So the function of the eustachian tube is to maintain or equalizing the pressure uh, on each side of the eardrum, and it is a narrow passage that is leading from the pharynx to the cavity of the middle ear. Okay. So pharynx to middle ear. So that is the answer for the question. And now we'll move on to. Um, uh, uh, the second last question this is the 15th question in our series and uh, this is from the endocrine system and the question is which are the two posterior pituitary hormones arriving directly from the hypothalamus so the question is which are the two posterior pituitary hormones arriving directly from the hypothalamus so think about the posterior pituitary hormones and you can answer this question very easily and the options are the first one is insulin and thyroxine the second option B, oxytocin and insulin. Option number C, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. And option number D, ACTH and growth hormone. So what is the answer? Posterior pituitary hormone. Obviously, it's a very simple question and the answer is option number C, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So 
uh, we very well know that the posterior lobe produces two hormones that is vasopressin and oxytocin and the other name for the vasopressin is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. ADH antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin and uh, oxytocin are the two posterior lobe hormones okay so i think uh, that question also is very very clear for you now we will move on to the last question the last question in our series that the very last question is from the oncology and the question is uh, the most common site of metastasis in choriocarcinoma is okay so uh, this was a previously asked question in the act examination so uh, just uh, answer this question the most common site of metastasis in choriocarcinoma so what is the answer? So the options are option number A, lung cancer uh, to the lungs, then option number B, vagina, option number C, pelvis and option number D, brain. So where choriocarcinomas can metastasize? So first of all think about what is a choriocarcinoma. So you should understand what is a choriocarcinoma and where it can metastasize. metastasize. So what is the answer? So the answer of for our last question is option number a that is lungs okay so uh, first we will see what is choriocarcinoma so you know that from the name itself choreo choriocarcinoma is a malignant trophoblastic cancer usually of the placenta okay so that is a placental cancer and it is a trophoblastic cancer and it is a type of malignant cancer and it is characterized by early hematogenous spread to the lungs okay so hematogenous spread will be there and it will be to the lungs okay so it is a very very important question that was asked in the previous SET exam also so uh, I think uh, we have come to the end of this session and uh, this uh, chorea carcinoma also can be classified as a germ cell tumor and may arise in the testis or in the ovary okay so this uh, it is a germ cell tumor uh, it can happen not only in the um, placenta it can happen in the testis and in the ovary also okay so with that we are coming to the end of this session so in this session we have explained 16, 16 questions from various uh, topics from our mm, nursing subjects and uh, all these questions what we, we have explained or ex uh, discussed today is very very important because not only that question but also the other options what we have explained also is very very important. So once again thank you for uh, watching the video till the end and uh, uh, once again I request everyone uh, to share about this platform to your nursing friends and make use of it okay. So thank you for watching kindly keep in touch and uh, wait for the next video to come till that time. Take care. Bye.